course, Introduction to Human-Computer Interaction. This is course on NPTEL. This is week 9, but I'm going to cover some content that we showed in week 8 uh, quickly and we'll cover on the week na uh, 9 content. So what did we see last time? And, and I'm hoping that you're enjoying the class. Uh, I see the attention, I see the discussion mailing list going up. Keep it uh, flowing like that and please feel free to share the experiences that you have and the things that you're thinking about this uh, topic. Uh, on the mailing list. It will be fun to see what uh, what you're doing and what how you're applying things that you're learning from uh, this course. So when we finished last time, I actually walked you, to through, walked you through different services that are available that we are using currently and how they looked many, many years before. 1997 Google, uh, 2018 Google, 1994 Yahoo, 2018 Yahoo, 1995 MSN, 2018 MSN, 1996 Apple, 2018 Apple, 1996 eBay, 2018 eBay. Right? So this, the whole purpose of actually showing you this is to convey the point that the design that you're doing now will follow some of the patterns that are emerging now and the patterns that are available now and the designs that look cool, look uh, very uh, appealing, attractive to the audience now. For example, Apple now is like this because they have the trend of actually keeping it that way, which is very simple, which is uh, showing you the information only what they want you to look at, particularly uh, very boldly presenting the information that they have. Now let's get into the topic of uh, uh, visual design, right? Visual design is an interesting uh, topic is because it is going to get you introduced to how information visually that you can present is actually going to make a difference a lot. For example, I would ask you to just think about, let's take a website called timesofindia.com. Just visualize what the timesofindia.com website is or just open up uh, the browser panelly and see how the information is presented. Compare that to uh, uh, information that is presented in an elevator for you. Just think about it. And compare it to the information that is presented in this remote for the uh, slide changer, right? So visually, the information that is getting presented in different ways conveys different information and the way that you present this information can be actually appealing to the users, can appeal to the users and thereby your usability may increase. I'm going to walk you through some, uh, so to say, design patterns and visual design. So the topics that we're going to cover is grid systems, hierarchy of size, grouping, small multiples, repetition, and color. So first, grid system. One of the things that you would actually realize uh, in the systems, in the services that we use regularly, for example, uh, the example that I told you, timesofindia.com, if you look at timesofindia.com and let's take Washington Post and let's take uh, New York Times, the information is actually presented in a very gritty format, right? So grid is the way that the information is printed. So just look at this, right? The, the highlighted ones are uh, in the grid, right? Uh, on top, on the left, on the right, and in the middle. Take Facebook, that's how it is. Take Twitter, that's how it is. So therefore, this information presentation in a grid form is very, very... Uh, popular and information presented in this visual form has some appeal to the users who are referring to these web services and who are using these services. Let's continue on looking at other uh, uh, types of visual designs. Hierarchy of size, grouping, small multiples, repetition and color. Let's look at a few more. This is grouping, visual proximity, visual grouping. In that, there are multiple ways of actually visual grouping. So I'll, I'll give you examples as you as we move forward. I have some images also which actually walks you through uh, these examples, which will let you to think through where all this can be actually applied. Proximity, right? So when you wanted information to be presented that is relevant to each other, you put them close to each other. For example, I'm sure you would, uh, if, you, if you think about uh, research papers where you have seen tables, Without a line also, the information presented next to each other and uh, there, let's take there is a sub column, uh, a column is broken into two more columns and that information is presented. Without a line also, if the information is presented like this, 
visually you will think that they are actually uh, uh, same group same thing you can think of it as on the horizontally also i assume that's making sense just think about it uh, where information is presented you want the two uh, pieces of information together and that's presented next to each other if they're close there is some kind of grouping that the designer wants you to have in mind same visual grouping this is similarity now the earlier one was proximity now it is similarity what does similarity mean similarity here is for example look at the look at the first one on the left that is showing you the red colors and the black colors right it is basically saying that oh i'm i'm actually putting the first column to be all red third column to be all red which means they're all of the similar similar uh, grouping that i that the designer wants to make same thing in the uh, second one which is horizontal third one is uh, slightly different where the similarity has been presented with the circles so the ones that are diagonally there i'm presenting that there's those are similar values so to say here is another one visual grouping with connections i mean you can you can think of this as in the first category also in terms of proximity itself visual grouping proximity now in within the proximity i could actually put them uh, if i were to have connections i'll draw a line between them right. so these are the different types of groupings that you could do here are more uh, grouping that uh, are more practically you could see very regularly this is ordering right ordering is elevator is a simple example where the information is presented uh, in some order uh, of the uh, floors that you are going to take in the elevator i'm sure you you able to recollect the elevator discussion that we had in the lecture week 1 where we said that elevator has one of the good designs by uh, keeping the mirror outside the elevator or inside the elevator so that you will actually have uh, a, the the person taking the elevator getting distracted but i'm going to show you some examples how elevator design here in terms of ordering is actually pretty bad in that sense or some things to take away from uh, in in the in the visual grouping ordering is to actually look at the different designs that you see while taking elevators let's see if uh, when whenever you're taking uh, elevators from now when you're listening to this lecture if you find any of these interesting designs uh, interesting visual grouping in the elevators please take a picture and send it as a group uh, in the mailing list now making things distinct so i think if you think about this the the meaning if i just say danger you will already recollect that the way that danger information is presented is so to say a triangle and an exclamation in between right and if i say uh, let's take a bumper in the road a speed breaker in the road so there is traditionally now we are using black color and a yellow color uh, half i mean as stripes right so that's the way that you're presenting things that are distinct that you want to keep normal road and then a speed breaker in a different color so you could think of all of this in the ways by which we are consuming this information we are taking this information that is presented so in this case size size value orientation texture shape and position but let me go through one uh, one by one size right so i'm sure you would have seen size and shape some similar examples that you could have uh, size is Uh, the uh, let's take if you are looking at um, look at the toys that kids play they would have sizes uh, for example uh, making things distinct right so in this case the the reason how you actually would I'm sure you've seen these kind of shapes in different places. Let me give you some examples. Let's take, let's pick the orientation. Orientation is meaning when you play Lego or when you play with the toys, they keep it in which direction the screw has to be kept, right? The nuts and bolts, how they have to be placed. For example, texture. You could think of it as the way that uh, the the roads are sometimes placed, right? So if you're putting less uh, check for a chessboard game like that. in where the checks are very small the expectation is that it will be more rough and then if it is the checks are slightly uh, bigger the surface is supposed to be less rough in that sense a uh, shape i think you could also think of it in the playing games with the kids uh, there are games where you keep a, they they'll have a triangle and you only a triangle will go into the uh, uh, triangle shaped object will go into the triangle circle and square and square right so those are the ways that these kind of 
making things distinct from the design, visual design point of view is getting implemented. Value also, right? The grayscale, uh, the level of grayscale would depend. For example, if you go buy paint to uh, paint your home or a wall or anything, the uh, the organization where you plan, the, the shop where you plan to buy the paint will actually give you a booklet where they'll show you different shades of, so to say, the same blue color, different shades of, so to say, the same green color. So that's the value. Let's move on in terms of small multiples, right? Small multiples, let's look at the bottom one first. Bottom one is basically showing you small changes in the way how uh, the person who's bringing the uh, airplane to stand still in the airport would do. Small instructional changes that the person is doing, starting from uh, like this, going like this and then coming like that and then closing it, bringing it to the place, right? So that's what he's trying to do. And these small indications, small changes is represented in the visual design. And I'm, I'm sure you already made connections to saying that safety for these aeroplanes when they're landing is super important. And that's why these kind of instructions have to be very, very clear, very, very, uh, so to say, explicit to them. And the one on the top is actually small multiples of different color shades. Again, this is connecting to the uh, value, the one that I was talking about here. It's different colors. You, you want to buy a t-shirt, you want to print something on the t-shirt, you want a certain type of t-shirt. Uh, if you go to shops or if you go to even online uh, shopping uh, services, they would actually provide you information about different shades of the same thing, different colors of the same kind of uh, uh, design t-shirt or a cloth. That's small multiples and the variations are actually small from let's take let's look at the uh, right hand most two of them the the shades look very similar where or, or looks very close to each other but there's a small difference between them that's the small thing that we're talking about here let's come back to uh, repetition uh, repetition of design elements right so this is microsoft word from where you can actually see that uh, we, we generally have, actually, you can even think about it as a research paper. Even in a research paper, we actually have different parts of the research paper clearly to highlight uh, uh, how, for example, section looks different from subsection. Subsection looks something different from sub, 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 subsection, right? So in that repetition of the designs, repetition of the fonts, repetition of the structure of the document is actually necessary for people to quickly get what they want to get out of the paper also, right? Figures are kept differently, tables are kept differently, all of that. So that's repetition of design elements. Uh, in this case, I'm uh, using the uh, font to explain the repetition of the design elements. I'm sure you can talk about other ways of repeat, repeating the design elements also. Here's some things about color. Color in terms of, uh, just look at this uh, uh, map and think about what all it is representing and look at the, the next one. Which one would you prefer for understanding the map? Map one or map two? Map one, of course, is, is two. Uh, the colors that they have used is many. It's not the shades of the same color. Therefore, it's hard to read it. It's also very uh, appealing to the eye because appealing in terms of actually it is, it is hard for me to observe the colors that are presented in this, uh, in this map. This one is very pleasing uh, because they have just taken brown or shades of brown, blue and some shades of blue. So therefore, and also the water is also represented here. So therefore, you could also argue that water is connected to blue. So that therefore, uh, using some shades of blue is always going to be better. So continue on this um, uh, color scheme itself. It is very clear that using uh, in such scenarios where you want to actually show uh, information, shades of color makes a lot more sense. And that's why if you see in heat map kind of concepts where uh, when when a color is picked, it's better to pick a, a gray scale. It's be better to pick a scale which where you can actually do uh, the shades of that color and show emphasis on some information that is getting more and more prominent. So here is another um, view on this visual visual design itself look at these uh, images on the three by three metrics uh, left and top uh, 
one by one to one by two to all the images, right? So if you look at these images, I'm sure you're, you're connecting to some of the uh, things that you already know. For example, the left and top uh, looks like it's a, say, a map uh, with some projections on top. Uh, one by one and two by one looks like a brain which is one sort of imaging of a brain and uh, three by one looks more like a spinal cord of a, of a person uh, with some projections again on uh, elevations on some things that uh, needs more emphasis on and two by one two by two and two by three is a version of the same thing continuing on the heat map kind of concept uh, where it is uh, showing a different color, so to say, slightly more reddish when the information is information there has more emphasis on it. And then the third uh, column, which is uh, one by three, two by three, and three by three, is another version of the same kind of brain. Uh, let's take a land versus water map and the spinal cord. I'll leave it to you for a second to think about which type of information presentation is actually useful and relevant in particular type of uh, context. Now, if you think about it, right, so the one on the uh, left and uh, top uh, one by one is actually very relevant if you're if you wanting to showcase information like uh, let's take hill, uh, let's take uh, uh, places where you want to show that certain type of information is available, so, so to say the projection. Hills are the best way of explaining. The same way you will see one by three also, which is more like uh, saying blue lines, uh, blue edges with green mark, green in the area showing plantation, showing forest, showing land, all of that information is presented. In, uh, in the second row, if you see again, the two by three probably presents you with the most amount of information in that column, which is, which is giving you, let's take if I were to analyze where the tumors are, uh, where, the, where there is any, um, so to say, anomaly in the uh, brain scan, you can capture that. And again, in the third row, you will see that the second uh, column provides you slightly more information, say, say uh, if you were to look at how the kneecaps are, how the fluid in the kneecaps are available, the heat map is presenting you saying there is some kind of disorder there, some kind of thing that you should actually look at more carefully. Right? So the point here is not to actually find uh, how these are used and in which context it is, uh, what are these images? The reason why I wanted this to be discussed here is different ways of information visual design is appealing, is useful, is relevant in different types of uh, context. That's the point I wanted to get across. I hope that makes sense in terms of uh, uh, visual design, uh, how information is presented. I hope that helps in getting a sense of visual design. Let me now walk you through certain uh, uh, grouping, uh, visual grouping that I showed you before, which is elevator um, numbers, and talk to you about few of the things that I've seen in this context. So here is one way of presenting that uh, information, which is the ground G0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 is going from left to right. And the first, it's a four by four matrix. And the first uh, one by one, one by two, two by one, and two by two is taken for other purposes like fan, bell, uh, open the door and close the door. Whereas the four on the other side is taken for G012. And uh, it also has three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten 10 going from left to right. This is one type of the design, right? So I'll show you more designs here. Look at this one. This one, I mean, when I was looking at it, it was kind of interesting to see how they have actually decided to take this kind of an approach where you will see the user is the cognitive load of the user in figuring out where the button is is actually higher here so let's go from bottom majority of it is from bottom so let's see uh, and it's also from left to right so there's some b which is probably basement and then there is a push to talk 
and then there are spaces in between so it's not a clean matrix let's take it's it could have been nicely put as four by four matrix the one same as in the left one and uh, the information could have been presented exactly the easily and then there's also lock in between uh, which is kept uh, which is next to the seven in the left so one two three four which is okay in the second row from bottom uh, five six and then there's a space and then seven eight nine ten eleven and then there's twelve so essentially twelve went on the uh, left and top because there's a spot that is uh, in the column as to say two by uh, three which is an empty space If only if 7 could have been moved here to the left, everything could have been fit into a 4 by 4 matrix. They essentially wasted all the space uh, in the row of 12, uh, both in terms of material, in terms of design, everything, uh, because they had left some spaces in between. So I hope that is letting you to think about uh, these kind of designs. So I, I, I generally take pictures when I uh, see such things. I've, I've had... Uh, one or two other interesting experiences even in the airports in India where there is uh, certain uh, uh, airports where there is an elevator to go from ground zero to uh, L1 which is lower one or minus one so to say whereas there is no there is no escalator to come from uh, minus one to zero that is you can actually take an escalator going from zero to one level lower but there's no escalator to come up from minus one to zero which is you have to either take steps or find an elevator which is in a different location to come to the uh, floor in the zero simple things uh, people make decisions like this and it causes so much of so to say um, work for the citizens for the passengers who are going to go there years after years after years in the airport because they have just made this decision of not having an escalator to go from minus one to zero here are some more examples of elevators so this is more so uh, a cleaner one which is again a four by five metrics but interestingly, the numbers go from bottom to top and continues like that, right? 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 is on the column 1 and then 6, 7, 8, 9, 10 is on the next column, right? So uh, again, again, people using different types of you know, elevators, uh, if, you're going, if you're going to find out these kind of things regularly different, it's going to be hard to use these elevators. But this is at least a simple one, which is 5 by 5 matrix. 4x5 matrix. Here is another one, which is also 5x4 um, matrix, 5 rows and uh, 4 columns. And there is this um, button for closed door and open door at the bottom. And then uh, 1, 2, 3, 4, uh, properly arranged 1, 2, 3, 4 till 21. And, and you can easily guess uh, there is no 13 in this uh, is because there are some countries which don't want to have a 13th floor uh, in the building. And if you see on the left one, there is 13. In the right one, there is no 13. Right? So that's the, these are all cultural effects on uh, the design also. I Meaning if you're finding a way to design, you have to also keep in mind the cultural aspect of it. If you remember the lecture one or week one, you will understand that there was design, there was people, the human, and there was also this technology and the whole thing was captured in something called as organization or the context. Or it, you could also put the word as culture for that. So that, that's what is impacting the number 13 in the elevator uh, board on the right hand side one. And this is another one which is just two columns going from bottom to up. Uh, going from left to right, bottom to up. Right? So that's the order in which this is there. Minus one, zero, one, two, three, four. And it goes about uh, seven, seven rows in, in two columns. And this is one of the other interesting ones that I've found, uh, which is uh, they, the floors are not numbered, but they are alphabets. 
and the alphabets are also presented here interestingly if you see here uh, it says b c d e f g h i j k i don't see an a and there's also some color scheme uh, which is presented next to the uh, buttons and uh, d it looks like d is the ground floor and uh, b c are probably the uh, basement floors And of course, the color scheme, if you look at it, uh, it uh, looks like this is a hospital elevator in the hospital and the color schemes are probably presented with the kind of uh, things that are done in that floor, kind of uh, doctors that sit in that floor. Right? So lots of information gets conveyed in these kind of elevator buttons itself. And I'm sure you're getting a sense of how uh, to keep looking for these kind of things when you're also uh, taking an elevator, not just elevator, anything I guess, driving a car, uh, going in an aeroplane, uh, going in a bus, walking on the corridors of buildings. There's always something to think about in these kind of designs that uh, you kind of interact uh, in your day-to-day -day life. <clears throat> now let's spend some time on looking at how to get the color right. I think since we saw now the visual design, how information is presented, now let's look at how to get the color right. So some of the tips that I would say is design, generally designing over grayscale uh, is, a, is a very good idea. One, it forces you to think about uh, where to focus on intensity and of course uh, uh, you, should, you should play around with different shades of gray to start with your design because that helps you to also think through where the emphasis is going to be. A keep luminance intensity values for grayscale when moving to color helps ensure everything remains clear. So I'll show you something about uh, the color wheel also in, in a minute or two and then walk you through actually what this luminance hue intensity is all about in uh, having. If you remember the map that I showed you in terms of uh, the color visual. So this one here where the intensity is very high this this image has the intensity this red colors and shades of reds has intensity is very high and therefore it's actually hard to digest the color pure saturated colors requires more focusing than less pure desaturated pastels don't use saturated colors in ui unless you really need something to stand out Right? So you want to use the saturated colors only when so the, the, the colors are presented here at the uh, bottom right. You want to use all these colors only it is really really required. Again if you remember the colors that are presented here are the colors that was usually used in the map that I showed you right now. So avoid using these colors because it actually takes away the focus a lot. So again, avoid simultaneous display of high saturated spectral extreme colors, same as in the map that I showed you. Minimize uh, cyan blues at the same time as reds. Uh, so why do you want to actually avoid these kind of colors? So that's about focus, right? So getting the uh, focus in the colors right. Now this is, this is the Adobe's uh, color wheel. So what I would suggest you to do is, I would ask you to go to this URL, color.adobe.com and play around it yourself, right? Which is uh, monochromatic, triad, complementary colors, compound shades, uh, compound color shades and custom, right? So these are all different ways by which you can actually get the color uh, combination for your design that you're doing. You can play around with uh, this color wheel in terms of deciding on what color do you want, take the XR code from here and present it, uh, use it in your uh, design. And there are many ways to actually figure out which color is uh, appropriate and one of, the, one of the services that is available is this Adobe uh, color wheel. And this color wheel is a theme, Adobe is only making it easier. Adobe is only an uh, indicative of uh, these kind of uh, services available but the color wheel is a concert where you could actually find out what color to use by presenting combination of uh, picking combination of different colors that you want so now i'm going to move on to a different uh, uh, set of topics like as i said fitz law is the next one that i'm going to be looking at uh, did, does anybody in the class have any um 
experience or understanding of cognitive work that uh, you've seen. So cognitive science is actually an important area and particularly if you look at uh, human computer interaction, cognitive science uh, is, is playing a big role in the HCI domain. And I know many faculty who are, who are doing HCI now are actually uh, PhDs in cognitive science. That's what cognitive science. Cognitive science is about how brain uh, processing information and how the brain actually captures information, stores it, all of that is cognitive science. One of the big questions that uh, cognitive scientists ask is how uh, brain actually finds out the objects that are presented to. So one of the work, I, I'll just briefly mention this, if any of you are interested in uh, taking a look at it, please go look at Michael Jest and Tom Mitchell's work where what they're trying to find out is they're trying to find out uh, if an object is presented in front of you, what words come to your mind, right? If, let's take for example, I'm presented with ice cream, what words come to my mind is something that they're trying to capture, that they're trying to predict, that they're trying to find out if programmatically, if a system could actually do it. Currently, they're doing studies where they've kept uh, sensors all around your head, uh, using which they're saying that, okay, we would actually predict the word uh, if ice cream is present in front, uh, cool, it'll melt, uh, it's a summer season, all of that. So what I'm going to request you to do is I'm going to request you to go watch this video. This is an interesting video from the point of view of, uh, because I would request you to watch the video and then come back to the lecture here. Uh, before you go to the next uh, slide, which is please watch this video. It's an interesting video because where uh, they're trying to find out uh, whether this bird will make a mistake of clicking on coffee versus doomsday. And the bird was asked, eagle was asked to actually go get a mug of coffee. Uh, but you will see what happens when uh, the bird does uh, pick up a coffee. I hope you saw the video now. Once uh, you've seen the video, tell me, uh, think about what went wrong, right? Uh, what are the things that went wrong? The things that went wrong are uh, probably the, the bird was trained to actually pick up coffee, but the design flaw is that coffee and doomsday is kept close to each other. It is not only that they're kept close to each other. If you think about from the point of view of usability or usage of these buttons, Coffee is something the bird is going to pick up, use very regularly, and doomsday is going to be very rarely, right? So the button that is uh, a feature that is very rarely used and a feature that is very frequently used are kept together, which is also a design flaw. What, what can you do to fix it? Right, one, one approach is to just take it away, um, take uh, take the doomsday button and keep it separately. For example, in the movies you would have seen they, these kind of doomsday or emergency buttons are kept under the table somewhere uh, where the uh, person can actually stretch his leg or hand and press the button. Some things like that. Whereas coffee button is something that they would use very regularly, so keep it in a place that is uh, quickly reachable also. So in this context only, this idea of Fitts law comes in. What does Fitts law mean? Let me, let's just read through this definition of what Fitts law is. It's a model of human movement primarily used in human computer interaction and ergonomics. Ergonomics is the area by which if you would have seen uh, keyboards are designed. Uh, I'm sure there are some of you would have seen a keyboard, which is also circular. The, the keyboards that we use now are not the natural ways of actually your hand uh, using it. So therefore, having a design uh, keyboard, which is very, so to say, natural, native to your hands, is so much necessary. So that's ergonomics that predicts that uh, uh, time required to rapidly move to a target area is a function of the distance to the target and the size of the target. So just think about the video that you just now saw. Even in that video, the target area is the buttons, right? So the target area is, um, function of the distance to the target and the size of the target. Distance of the target is the bird was sitting very close to it. That's the distance and size of the target is the size of the button. So the way you could think of is the coffee button being so frequently used, it could be actually 
a pretty large button whereas doomsday button is a very rarely used uh, so it could be a slightly smaller button too right things like that these are the ways by which you will actually figure out uh, uh, how to apply fit's law so this is probably the only slide in the entire course where you will find an equation in this class it says fit's law tells us about difficulty for pointing and selection tasks predicts time to make a movement moving hand is a is a series of micro corrections right so it's a moving hand is a series of many many millions of uh, points that are connected to get to the point, to to get to the target a and b are empirically derived constants where time is uh, the longitude log of distance uh, size plus one. So this is just a math function. Forget about what it is. This is not necessary. It is only to say that it is a function of, as in the light slide, it's a function of the distance to the target and the size of the target. That's what is in this function, distance and size. Time to move the hand depends only on the relative precision required, right? Because it is the precision that is uh, that you need. Because in the coffee button, if you want to be precise to clicking on the coffee button versus precise to be clicking on the doomsday. So that's uh, so that's uh, Fitz law. Let's see some examples of how we can actually, where Fitz law has been applied and which one works better. So just look at the left one, which is a pop-up uh, linear menu from Tuesday to uh, today till Saturday. So that's, uh, let's assume that it's a calendar event that you want to create and that's the options that are presented to you. The one on the right is pop-up pie menu where you can choose the same Monday to Friday using the pie menu. Which, which do you think will be faster on average? I think it's very clear that the one on the right will be the faster, right? Because it has long, it has more space for us to select, and it's easier probably to select it here. But the that's the that's the way Pi menu would work: bigger targets and less distance, right? So that's the reason that's the way Fitz law is getting applied. If you recollect what Fitz law is, but interestingly, the way that the Pi menu works now on the right hand side for the seven options is okay. But unfortunately, if this was 25 options, it's going to be harder to do it in the Pi menu, right? And uh, Pi menus are very popular in some devices. For example, uh, if you would have used iPod, uh, Pi menu is very popular. There are some gaming devices where Pi menus are actually very popular. Even if you uh, recollect the, the TV remote, the main functionality, so to say channel up and channel down and volume up and volume down, sometimes comes in the uh, Pi menu form. Here are some examples uh, where Pi menus are in practice, some games, um, some places where you have seen the one on the right hand top is a device where you will actually use to uh, say erase, pull, smooth and push. It's a tool where it is used and the left hand bottom is something like a TV remote also. Project, edit, view and context. Pi menus in practice, if better, why don't we see more of them, right? So because it is, uh, if, if by going back on the slide, if Pi menus are going to work well, why is that we don't see them very frequently in the uh, devices that we use? It's because it's harder to implement. It's harder to implement uh, because you need that much of space. Don't scale past a few items. Seven is okay, but beyond five, six or something, it's hard to uh, use. Uh, unfamiliar to people right so if you put this pie type of menu in all the all the uh, devices that we see or use now then people are not going to I mean it's very unfamiliar for users so they are not going to use it well they're not going to use it properly unfamiliar devices are actually uh, ways by which users I mean I, I think we have seen it this before also right the change in uh, technology is very quick Whereas change in human beings is very, very slow, right? So that's the reason why uh, if you bring in some unfamiliar devices, users are going to take time in adapting it. 
So that wraps up my uh, Fitch law. So what I'm going to do now is something called as Gulf. And uh, you would have, uh, we talked about Norman um, in the first uh, couple of lectures. Don Norman, who is popular uh, for his uh, HCI contributions. And while we were talking about visual design, I also wanted to mention about uh, Edward Tufte. Edward Tufte, uh, E-D-W-A-R-D, -E, Edward Tufte, T-U-F-T-E-E. -E. Uh, it's a it's a person you want to go look him look him up right so he does a lot he has a lots and lots of books on uh, visualization and he does lots of lectures on visualization also and I would highly recommend you to go look up uh, uh, Edward Tufte for anything more you need on visual uh, visualization. So here is here is the task in front of us and I'll tell you I'm going to use this example to decide how to take it for take the uh, topic of uh, Gulf forward interface cycle right so what I'm going to explain now is just think about this as a word document I want to draw a thin box around this title uh, if you were to draw a thin box around this title uh, what are the things that you would do how would you go about doing it I let you to think for a second which is what menu will you click how will you go to the menu what are the options that are available what tool am I using and everything like that right so those are the things that you will you will uh, think about while uh, deciding on to having a box around uh, those are the things that you will be thinking about having a box around the text let me now walk you through the how this whole interface, how this whole uh, interactions between Microsoft Word and uh, uh, the the person deciding So now let me walk you through this interface cycle. What does this mean? This is basically the how the interactions between the human beings, that is you and me, interacting with the Microsoft Word in this case. So we are trying to build the uh, box around the text. Okay. So now our system you updates the display. So let me put through put through everything and then I'll walk you through how it is working. So system and the user. Right? System is uh, dis updates the display, updates internal state, and interprets input events. That's what system is doing. Updates display meaning when you draw a line, it's going to actually show that there is a line. Updates internal state is when you click on a button, uh, let's take insert, it knows that now the next one that you're going to do is options inside the insert. That's the internal state that it is changing. Interprets the input events. Input events are things like clicking on insert in that a table. That's the input event. In the input event, so system has to capture what the current state of the input is. Use that to make some decisions and display decisions for the user. In the user side, evaluates and understands the display. Microsoft Word is presented. I'm going to look at what information Microsoft Word is presenting to me. I look at it. I evaluate it and then I make a decision on what to do. Formulates goals and actions, which is I formulate my goal as the thin box around the text. Actions are given that I want to click on uh, insert. I will use that to give my action input to the system. Acts to produce inputs. So depending on the devices, depending on my uh, actions that I want to take, I am producing inputs through the system for the system to react to it, for the system to decide and make decisions and show me the updates accordingly. System is interacting with users through displays. User is interacting with the system using the input devices, mouse, keyboard, all of that. I assume that is making sense in terms of the interaction between the system and the user. 
Now, let me walk you through the two gulfs of evaluation and execution. The main goal for a designer is to keep reducing the gulfs when the user is interacting with the system. One gulf is gulf of evaluation, which is the user perceives and interprets states of the system. This is about user evaluating what is presented to him or her and making a decision accordingly. If the user is not able to evaluate the information presented or options presented and it is taking it is difficult for the user to make the decision then it is gulf of evaluation gulf of execution is users formulate inputs to achieve goals which is i am saying i want to draw the box on the line and if I'm not able to execute what I want, then there is a gulf. Evaluation is user perceives and interprets the state of the system. Whatever the system is, I'm evaluating what it is. If, I, if there are mistakes in evaluation, if there are, I'm not able to perceive, I'm not able to interpret the state of the system, what is presented to me, it's gulf of evaluation. Gulf of execution is I'm not able to achieve the goals that I want to achieve through the input devices that I have. I assume that is able to make sense. For example, in the Microsoft Word, if the options are presented when I click on insert, if I don't understand it, it is more close to evaluation. I, I'm not able to interpret the state of the system. If I'm not, for user, user formulates inputs to achieve the goals. If I click on the button, insert table and I'm not able to achieve what I want, then it's gulf of execution. The main goal that Norman argues is keeping to reduce these gulfs as much as possible. So now, can you tell me where gulf of evaluation is in this particular example? I'll let you to think about it. Gulf of evaluation, user understands and evaluates displays. Pretty easy to see no black box around the text yet. Compare editing web pages to text editor. That's probably you could, there are many ways to get the box around the text. It does not have to be only the Microsoft Word. I could use it by creating it as an HTML page and writing it a few lines of code for it. Formulates goals and actions, add a black box, acts to produce inputs, too many buttons, too many menus, what's the dog on the side for? So that's gulf of evaluation, right? there's too many menus, too many buttons, I am not able to give, I'm not able to understand what the state of the system is, I'm not able to perceive what things the system is presenting to me. That's gulf of evaluation, I'm not able to evaluate what the system is presenting to me. What are the main reasons why gulf of evaluation happens? Some of the big reasons why gulf of evaluation happens is poor use of colors, bad layout, poor grouping, important information looks same as unimportant. See, I'll connect you, connect this to many things that we have seen until now. Poor use of colors in the mapping that we map that we saw now. Bad layout and poor grouping. The grouping that we saw, proximity, all of that. The elevator examples that I showed you, there are some poor grouping examples there. Important information looks same as unimportant. You could just connect this to doomsday and the coffee button that was that we discussed. Forcing people to remember a lot of things. The menus that are in the Microsoft Word, it is forcing me to remember a lot of menus that are available. Lack of feedback in response to inputs. I'm giving some input and I see that the system 
is not responding the way my mental model is designed. Unfamiliar display of information. I don't know the design patterns that the system is presenting to me. I don't know the conventions. If you remember the multiple things, small multiple things, what we saw before, if you don't understand the conventions that the person is using for getting the flight on the location, you are not going to understand what the information that they are displaying is. So unfamiliar display of information. So these are the some of the main reasons why the gulf of evaluation happens. Let's look at some of the reasons why gulf of execution happens. Unfamiliar devices, unfamiliar interactions, because now it is about me understanding what is presented to me and trying to complete the task, complete the goal that I have. Don't know what is possible. I don't know how to get the black box. I don't know. I drew a box, but it is actually a filled color box. I want to change it into a transparent box. I don't know how to do that. Widgets might not have meaning. For example, the dog that is presented. It was actually not a very good decision. Microsoft Word, Microsoft took the dog away in a short span of time after implementing it in one of their versions. Interaction patterns might not have meanings. For example, shopping carts in some locations. Right? These are metaphors that designers use in conveying the information to the users. Sometimes they are not very easily understandable. And that's why gulf of execution happens. What I suggest you to do now is what I suggest you to do now is find one interface that is cognizant and apply Fitz law and one interface that is not. What this will help you to do is this will help you to look for interfaces where you can see Fitz law applied or not applied. Find two interfaces where the gulf of evaluation is high and the two interfaces where the gulf of execution is very high. Right? Again, please go back to the slides, think about what these gulfs are and then uh, what I suggest is please post it on the uh, mailing list what you find so I can also give you comments on whether what you found were appropriate or not. So once you have done uh, this, I'm sure I'll let you to reflect on the activity that you just now did or that you would do in the coming week to finish to understand how these concepts like Gulf of Execution, Evaluation, Fitz Law, you have understood. With that, I'll stop the content on week 9. We are going to add actually some projects. So one another thing that we are planning to do in the next couple of weeks is to actually give you projects that students have done in the area of HCI where they have taken classes with me, which the, some of the projects are very good. What we are going to do is we are going to actually record about these projects and upload it for in, on the NPTEL platform. So you can actually get a sense of how these concepts are applied for doing a project and solving a problem.